Truly, this man was the Son of God. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill me with the word desperately needed to sustain life. And let me speak in the name of God, the Father and Mother of us all. Amen. Last week, when I emailed out the script for the Passion reading that we heard this morning to the different casts, the 8 o'clock class to the 9 o'clock cast, Ed Uhas, who was in our 9 o'clock cast, emailed me back and said, this seems a little short. And he's right. In other years, our Passion reading can take 25, 35, 45 minutes, And that's just the warm-up to the sermon. But this one is short. Indeed, as we have noticed a lot this year, as we have sat with this gospel mark, Mark is different. There's no birth narrative at all. It's the shortest of the four gospels with the least details and dialogue. And it ends with an implied resurrection. However, the austere telling of the passion in Mark's gospel does not lessen its impact. Indeed, it does a whole lot more than just make the Palm Sunday service shorter this year. This Spartan telling of the arrest, trial, torture, and crucifixion of Jesus draws us in like a minimalist painting or the austere music of Arvo Pert. The details and sharp relief, unadorned, absence of florid language, commentary, or pretense focus our attention. We cannot look away. The stark telling forces us to face Jesus' tragic death Head on. No doubt about it. Jesus' body was beaten. His flesh torn. His limbs nailed to the wood of the cross. He was lifted high into the air for all to witness his shame and disfigurement. When confronted with this brutal reality, we are forced to ask the question, why? Why did God's Son have to die this way? Notice that we are not forced to ask why Jesus had to die. We know that already. Jesus was human. Humans die. All humans die. It is our fundamental common denominator. We even start Lent with the primal reminder that we are dust. And to dust we shall return. Humans are mortal. We die. No, we are forced by the brutality of this story to ask why Jesus had to die this way. Why did Jesus have to die on a cross at the hands of the Roman Empire? Let's go back to the beginning of the book. The first verse of Mark's Gospel says, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The Son of God. And here, on the cross, when Jesus breathes His last, the centurion, an officer of Roman imperial military might, says, surely this man is God's Son. Now we need to remember. We need to remember that this was a tenet 
of Roman imperial theology that Caesar was the son of God. In Roman imperial theology, Caesar was the manifestation, the incarnation of divine power that, bought, that brought peace through victory. For the centurion to proclaim Jesus as the Son of God was a mutinous act of sedition and heresy against Rome. By dying on this cross, Jesus, the true Son of God, the actual manifestation and incarnation of divine power, refuses to participate in the violent means of oppression used by the empires of this world. Instead of proclaiming peace through victory, Jesus proclaims peace through sacrifice and trust in the enduring eternal power of God's love. God's love cannot be defeated by mere death. So Jesus is freed from the fight, flight, or freeze instincts of imperial forces. Jesus is free to surrender, trusting that no matter what, God's mission of love persists. Throughout Mark's gospel, there is a repeated cycle. Jesus preaches and proclaims the kingdom of God is near. Along the way, he forms a community marked by diversity, shared leadership, and equality. This community confronts the powers that be, the established leaders, those that perpetuate the system of domination. Jesus and the community are repeatedly chastised by the powers, but they are neither defeated nor destroyed. Rather, the community retreats, is restored, and resumes its mission of incarnating the kingdom of God right here, right now. Therefore, the cross in Mark's gospel is the ultimate conflict with the powers of domination. The grave, the ultimate retreat. And in the implied resurrection, we are left with the responsibility of continually resuming the mission of love. We are left with the responsibility. The mission of building an alternative community marked by diversity, shared leadership, and equality. So as you walk this aisle today and come to God's holy table, the question is before you. Will you continue the pattern of discipleship? Will you practice this pattern of discipleship by walking all the steps of Holy Week? Will you walk the way of Jesus, the way of love? Will you follow in the path of life, death, and resurrection that Jesus lays before you? Will you come and see then go and tell. Amen.